Dobré odpoledne, vítám vás na dalším díle našeho přednáškového cyklu Věda kontra internacionalita. Dneska tady máme zvláštního hosta až ze Švédska, je to Pontus Böckmann, který až nedávna byl prezidentem švédských skeptiků. Dneska nám poví o tom, jak vlastně vypadá covidová krize a covidová strategie ve Švédsku ve skutečnosti. Určitě jste o tom mnozí četli a teď vám aspoň může někdo o tam teď ukázat, jak to tam vlastně vypadalo, jak to tam bylo. Um, ráda bych vás také pozvala na plné léto úžasného programu, který pro nás přichystají pátečníci. Můžete se podívat na jejich web pátečníci.net, kde můžete podpořit naše aktivity na, skrze jejich startovač. A určitě vám za chvilku se ještě objeví i slajdy na obrazovce s tím programem pátečníků. A objevují se teď. Možná. Už tam jsou, výborně, tak jo. Um, děkujeme, že jste se k nám přidali, uh, jsme rádi, že se k nám přidáváte online, ale určitě si nenechte příště ujít, uh, přijít osobně. Uh, budeme moc rádi, když budete mít možnost si pohovořit s lidmi, které pro vás tady sem dovážíme a které sem pro vás zveme. Tak, uh, přehodím do angličtiny. Uh, welcome Pontus, uh, thank you so much for coming and giving us a talk about uh, how COVID actually looked like in Sweden because we read about it a lot in the Czech newspapers and on the Czech websites. So mm. we're very excited about hearing the real story from well, you. Well, as real as it can be. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me. I'm very honored and happy to be invited here today. I hope I can shed some light on this uh, enigma uh, because I, it was reported very differently in different parts of the world and a lot of criticism, but I'll, I'll get to that. I should uh, qualify myself at least first that I am not a medical expert. Uh, of course, as a Swede and as a skeptic and head of the Swedish skeptics, I, I follow this very, very carefully. And I do, my, do know my way a little bit around statistics. I'll try to make the statistics really uh, enjoyable for you as well later on here. So, but, it, well, I, I guess the pandemic is over now, right? The WHO said so last week or so. 
but I, I, that's a little bit arbitrary, I think. I think we all remember back three years ago when um, things were very different. We didn't have a vaccine. We didn't know much about the virus. And um, the question was, how do you react to something that you don't know a lot about? Uh, and that is potentially very, very dangerous. It turned out to be very, very dangerous as well. Sweden turned out to do some things very differently than the rest of the world. And that was heavily criticized. Uh, you see the, the header there. Sweden, Swedish PM warned over Russian roulette style COVID-19 strategy. And that's not my statement. This was actually from The Guardian. It was uh, on the 23rd of March 2020. And uh, here we have uh, four very not alarmed Swedish people who are sitting in the pub. When everybody else was in lockdown, they were still sitting in the pub. It's called the halfway in. Make of that where you want, what you want. It's from Stockholm. And um, there is, uh, well, people were scared and uh, everybody was scared. And in, well, I think uh, Sweden became the poster boy for, for a country that didn't take this very seriously. That's what the message was, I guess. So um, this is how a lot of the world uh, reacted, panic. And also in Sweden, to be honest, everybody panicked. And it was to a lot, to some extent, it was a political panic because there was a lot of politicians around out in the world, not just in Sweden, that were had a task that they didn't know much about. How do we handle this? So in Sweden, um, well, I should say sometimes panic is justified. Yeah, that, that's, that's a common. It, this was a serious thing. And it was taken very seriously also in Sweden, as you will see. Um, this guy became the, the face of the Swedish COVID response. His name is Anders Tegnell, and I think he even became a little bit famous outside of Sweden as well. In Sweden, he, came, he went from being a nobody, really, until being a household name. People, and it actually split the country in two different halves, uh, some that made him a hero, and some that uh, uh, vilified him and said, you are the guy who is making sure that we all are getting killed. So he was the head of the uh, public health agency. And what was one thing that was different in Sweden was that, and I'll come back to that as well, it, the politician pointed at him. You are the expert on these things. You decide what we should do. And he was very cocky. So uh, when he was criticized for not knowing what he was doing, he said like this, we are an agency of 500 people with competence in many fields. No one else has the combined expertise that we have. So don't tell me what to do. I know what I'm doing. That was basically the, the message he, he gave. So what did he do then? Um, well, first of all, it wasn't actually an experiment because there were decades of planning for a potential pandemic or epidemic of this kind done by the Swedish health authorities. They had for years and years said, what do we do if, or rather when the pandemic comes? Because every, and I think that was not just in Sweden, everybody in the health, all health experts knew that sooner or later, we will have this big epidemic. We don't know what it is yet. We had the SARS, and of course this is SARS COVID-2 or COV-2. Uh, so we had SARS before, it didn't turn out to be, but it was a sort of an alarm clock. So people were working on that. So there was an existing plan. It wasn't an experiment. Um, and uh, Anders Tegnell, he said, let's not panic. Let's, we have worked for decades on this plan. Let's follow the plan because we don't know anything that would be better. We, we don't know much about this virus yet. So let's just, let's not improvise, let's not throw away two decades of, of planning, let's follow the plan. And uh, the plan for Sweden was that you limited assembly to 50 people, couple, well, maybe a year later, they limited to eight. So they did, they did tweak the plan a little bit. They said, stay at home if any kind of illness, if you feel, any, if you feel bad at all, stay at home, don't go out and spread it. 
uh, work from home if you can. And I think that is an experience that we all got, I think globally, that suddenly it was okay to work from home and we all had to learn how to use Skype or Zoom or Teams and collaborate online. And uh, I think we still do, even when it's not necessary from, from a health position. So work from home if possible. Uh, don't, visit, don't visit the elderly and the elderly should not visit you because they may be a very, um, uh, a group that is very susceptible to this disease. So um, elderly should limit their social contacts and avoid traveling, of course. But there wasn't any lockdown in Sweden. This was, and that, this is what surprised people quite a lot, uh, this was recommendations, not restrictions. So please do this but we're not gonna fine you if, you if you don't, right? We have these recommendations, please do it. Um, there were no lockdown. Primary schools remained open uh, because there was uh, a feeling that it would be harder, it would actually be worse for the pandemic if we had, if you took all the little kids back home then, uh, then it would be harder for the society to work and everything would be very, very difficult. And hopefully, they said, the disease isn't too bad on the young anyway. Um, turned out to be right, but I know maybe that was just luck. And there was no mask mandate. And that was later amended a little bit, but basically under Signal, he didn't believe in masks. And that was very highly criticized. But what he actually said, he said, I do believe in masks. I know they work. We use them in hospitals all the time. What I don't believe in is to instruct people out, the, the community to use them correctly. So if we focus, everybody else was focusing on masks, masks, masks. If we focus on that, People will still not get it right. You, you have all seen people wearing the mask over their head and below the chin and wherever, you know, people didn't know. I saw a person just in, in, at this time, beginning of 2020, when it was a, some, some of us were using masks. I, I was using a mask. I was in a store to, to buy groceries because that was allowed. And I saw a guy uh, taking off his mask to sneeze and then put the mask back on again. So, okay, people don't understand why you have a mask, right? Uh, and that is why, so, Anders Tegnell was of the opinion that we can spend all the time we want to try to convince people to use masks properly, but they won't anyway, so let's focus on what we can do instead. That, that was his rationale. Again, I'm not a medical expert. I don't know if that was the right decision, but at least it was how the reasoning went. So why did we not have restrictions? Why all of this recommendation stuff? Why so soft on this? This is serious business, right? Shouldn't we lock down everything, close it up, make sure that people force people to, to follow the rules? Well, there are two, two answers to that. First of all, it's leg legislation and the other is cultural. When it comes to legislation, we have very strong laws about rights of assembly. That's why they couldn't really, uh, this is in the foundational law, you can't just change that overnight. Because of democracy and things, you couldn't limit people's uh, right to assembly to more than 50 people. And then they tweaked it, they passed an emergency law so they could put it to, to eight people. So. Um, that was one thing. So freedom of assembly, freedom of movement, very deeply rooted in the Swedish democracy. So it was very hard from, to, to create laws against this. Yeah, okay, so I took it in the wrong order. So pr right of assembly, right of movement. Uh, then there is another thing that is perhaps different in Sweden, a little bit more than in other countries. We rely a lot in the way the country is governed. We rely a lot on these governmental bodies, uh, not on politicians and parliament. The politicians passes the laws and they hand out the money, but they're actually not allowed to go out and in detail tell 
expert government bodies what to do. That's called ministerial interference, and that is prohibited. That is an offense in Sweden. So um, the politicians, I think, were pretty happy about this in, 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 at the time because it meant they couldn't, they, did, they couldn't be made responsible. They took a step back and said, we, we can't do anything. We hand you over to Anders Tegnell and his magnificent 500 experts at the health agency, and they will tell you what to do. Very convenient. You don't have to be uh, responsible or ask, answer to the public. Um, then there's the cultural differences. We haven't had a conflict in Sweden for a very, very long time. I think it was the last time we did have a major conflict, we were probably down here in Prague and making a nuisance of ourselves, and probably more than a nuisance. So, but it's, long, it's way back in history, which means that we have had a very benevolent government uh, or governing for a long, long time, for, more, for 200 years or even more. Uh, so that means that Swedish people are used to trust authorities and trust experts very much more, I think, than in other countries. And if you had the experience of another country where you have had dictators, you've had revolutions, you, have, you, you, you should not trust politicians, right? They sometimes do very stupid things and they take over and they have coups and stuff. We don't have that tradition in Sweden, which I believe, and now I should say also, this is Pontus Berkman speculating. So I should separate facts from, fi not fiction, but from speculation. This is what I think. And I think a lot of psychologists will agree with me. I, I know a few of them who do. So just take that with a grain of salt. But I think, I think that is ingrained in our culture that uh, the government wants, to, wants us well. They, they never uh, trick, they, they're not nefarious. They're not out to, to trick us. So that's very convenient, actually, for politicians. Um, then there's a certain amount of self-policing. I think that may be in other countries as well, but you follow the rules. I trust the rules because I'm a Swedish person, and I look at my neighbor, and I expect him to follow the rules as well. And if he doesn't, I will go over and tell him, hey, Mr. Neighbor, haven't you heard? We're not supposed to do this and that and that. And they, and in Sweden, they say, oh, I'm sorry. A little bit uh, the, what the Canadian trope, right? They say, oh, I'm very sorry. I will fix it. I'll, 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 I'll behave better. So that happens a lot in Sweden. Not all the time, of course, but more than in certain other countries. So Swedes do what they're told. And the recommendations work pretty well. Uh, people did actually follow the recommendations fairly well, uh, for, uh, well and still do, I think. And had we pushed more for masks, I think more people would have used masks as well. I, I, that's, again, a speculation on my part, but I think so. OK, so that's what we did. We, we had this softer version. We had recommendations, not restrictions. We expected people to do what they're told. Uh, how did it go? All right. Two months after the first high, uh, headline that you saw, we are playing rule, Russian roulette with the Swedish uh, public. This was the, the, Sweden now has the highest number of COVID deaths in the world. Didn't seem to work out very well. And at this point, I would say that the criticism was at the peak. Everybody said, look, look what you've done. You're letting everybody do whatever they want to, and now we're all dying, basically, was the, was the message. Um, so let's see, this article here, this is from a, a paper called Aftonbladet, one of the bigger papers in Sweden. In this, um, uh, under this headline, they had this graph, or rather they had the numbers, I've made a graph out of the numbers. So, confirmed COVID deaths per million people, so that's proportion to the public, right? Top 10 countries in the world, and this, this, is not a, this is not a contest you want to win. So it said top, it should also, maybe you should say bottom 10 countries. We were doing the worst. So 6.1 COVID deaths per million people, and that's the weekly average. 
weekly average. Uh, so Sweden was worse, then it was UK, Andorra, Belgium, Ecuador, and you can read the others yourself. Uh, and uh, it didn't look good. And um, I, it wasn't easy to be under Tegnell at this point. I can tell you, he, was, he, he got death threats. Um, now, statistics are, is hard, I will show that again. Now, what are these white things? Well, I went back, so go back here. The, the source of this data is from a site called Our World in Data. It's a, an open source, you can go to it today and look at the data. The thing is, this was the, when this was published, this was the, the fresh numbers from the day before. This was from the day before they had pulled those numbers from our, uh, our world in data. But sometimes statistics are wrong and people correct the statistics afterwards. So I went back to our world in data this week to look at exactly the same week, the, sa the same numbers should be the same numbers. And suddenly it looks very, very different. Uh, Sweden is only at 4.8, so there were corrections in the reporting. It wasn't 6.1, it's more like 4.8. Uh, UK was 6.3, so that was even worse. Uh, and the others have changed a little bit, more or less. Peru went through the roof, <laughs> suddenly. There were only 3.7 reported when the numbers were fresh. Now, three years afterwards, where they have updated the numbers several times, they are at 15.1, so Peru was, I don't know what happened there, I'm, I don't know. I certainly don't know what happened in Monaco because they've gone from having 3.6 to no deaths that week uh, from COVID. I don't know what's behind the numbers. Just to tell you, numbers do not always tell you the truth, but the truth is I can still say that Sweden is pretty bad, we're not doing well, uh, you, the, the line there is the European Union um, uh, average, and it's at 1.7. So Sweden was still uh, bad. All right. How come that is right? Well, again, statistics is hard. What do we mean with a COVID death? I think a lot of countries had different definitions of this. You can think of, of course, the direct death from the virus. That's, that's, not, that's a no-brainer. That's, that's a death from COVID. How about if you think it was COVID, but you didn't bother to test it because you were lacking resources? This looked like COVID, so I'm going to put it down as COVID death. But we don't know because we didn't actually test it. Um, then. Even if you know that it wasn't COVID, but you, had, you died from pneumonia, but you had very good reasons to believe that if you hadn't had COVID at the same time, you would have probably either not caught pneumonia in the first place, or maybe you would have survived. How do you categorize that? Is that a COVID death or not? Because the, 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 sort, the the reason for the death was actually maybe pneumonia or something else, or a heart attack. Heart attack, but the person was weak because he had just had COVID. I don't know. I, there's no absolute right answer here. Um, what if you die the week after you had COVID? You, is it still from COVID? Were you still weak? It could be. But what if you were run, out, ran over by a bus? Then it's probably not the COVID, right? So it's hard. Statistics is hard. COVID death is a very uh, difficult um, concept to, to define. And also, of course, you have the local doctor. How did he classify it? That's always a judgment call, and different doctors can do it differently. So instead of looking at COVID deaths, there's something called excess deaths. Uh, how many people died uh, beyond what you would have expected? Every, people die every day, right? But of, if there is a bigger number of deaths in the country, maybe that is a better statistic to, to go for. So this is from Spain, and Spain at one point uh, in June 2020, they had reported 28,000 
COVID deaths. But they had reported 43,000 excess deaths. So, so was there another disease there at the same time to, to, to explain the difference? Or is it maybe we shouldn't look so much at the COVID deaths as a number because it's harder to define and the excess death is, is probably a bit fairer. It's not without problems though, uh, but it is. So let, let's take at this excess death or excess mortality. Here you have Sweden. I hope you can see the other little fading lines. It's all different countries and um, uh, not all the countries, mostly Europe. And uh, you can see that Sweden in the beginning went spiked quite a lot. And then there was, and then there was a second hump here in, uh, it was late 2020, I think. And then it's been pretty stable, still above what you would expect it. So the, 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 the difference here is higher than you would have expected. But you can see it's not, it doesn't look like the worst country in the world. Um, if we look at UK, for instance, it looks like this. It ve looks very much like Sweden, but, but it's almost double all the time. And it still is. I think, well, it's still, the, the, this is, yeah, I think it's the, until the end of 2020. Oh, it's end of January 2023. So we're still above what you could expect. So does that mean that Sweden was okay then? Well, you wanted to be Denmark because Denmark was below for a long, long time and only now has risen a little bit. And here we come to another problem when statistics, because if you have very low number of deaths for a long time, then if you go back to normal, you compare it with the, the years before, then suddenly you get a, it looks like you're above, but maybe they just went back to normal. So no st statistics is hard. It, it, you can always tweak it the way you want it. And, um, so uh, Sweden, Denmark was very, uh, there was, it became a bit of a rivalry, even among skeptics, where the Dan Danish people, we, we talk a lot and uh, with each other and we're not afraid of criticizing each other. So Denmark was very, very uh, clear with that. They had a bit better response than Sweden had. And obviously it looks like it, yes. They, they probably did as well. Um, oh, I need to look, we have to look at uh, Czechia as well, Czech Republic. Totally different kind of curve, took longer for anything to happen and then it became very high and it's now still higher than, than expected. So I don't have an explanation for that, I'm just saying that different countries had different journeys. And, and maybe uh, because it took longer, you had a period here where you had exceptionally low number of deaths, which makes the expected number of deaths uh, uh, lower, which means that the, the curve gets higher later on. So again, statistics is hard. So Denmark said, the reason we are better is that we did much more testing than you did uh, in Sweden. So Denmark won this, if this was a competition, they'd really won. On the first 12 months, they test, they took 1,800 tests per thousand people. So that means almost every, uh, every Dane was almost tested twice. And that's important, that, maybe that is the trick because if you test people for COVID and you keep them home as soon as they show any, any, any COVID um, uh, disease, then maybe that is the trick. And Sweden was down here, only 400 around 400 tests per thousand people. So maybe that's what we did wrong. But then I'm thinking, well, Norway and Finland were also, they were almost as good as, as Denmark. And they were much lower in tests. So there's probably not just one solution here. I'm, maybe the tests in Denmark did a very good it may had a big impact and maybe that's what we should take away from this but it can't be everything because Finland and Norway were very much closer to to Sweden and uh, they did much better than Sweden. Czechia again since I'm here in Prague I highlight that we were almost exactly the same but you can see from the curve we had a totally different outcome. I think there's no 
one, there's never one single, in a complex situation like this, you can't point to one thing. It's not mask use, it's not, uh, it's not um, lockdown, it's not that number of tests. It's a combination of a lot of things. And it, I think after the fact, you can still just speculate. <coughs> So, the verdict, uh, how did we do in Sweden? So, again, it's complicated. We did well, or we did badly in certain cases. The mortality among the elderly was really, really bad. It was, that was universal, in a way, but it was specifically uh, bad in Sweden. I think it, it, a big chunk of the people who died were the elderly. And, uh, that I would blame on, and again, uh, flag, now I'm speculating again, but I think it be, it, it's because that we had privatized a lot of the homes for the elderly, and the way we've privatized it, there was a lot of small, or we still have that, lots of small, very nice and cozy homes for the elderly, maybe just 30 people living there, and that's nice, but the problem, I think, and the, what was reported as well, was that the, if you are a very small institution, you don't have the capacity to have the competence. They didn't have masks, enough of masks. They didn't know where to buy masks. They, they didn't understand what Anders Tegnell was saying, so they did a lot of things wrong. There were very clear, uh, that I didn't go through, but there were very clear recommendations exactly how you should do, how you should manage homes for the elderly, how often you should re replace your mask. You should not go from one patient to the other, to the third, of course. You need to wash your hands in between, blah, blah, blah. You don't, you don't want the elderly even to meet with each other too much because if one gets it, it spreads. And in the local, uh, smaller uh, homes for the elderly, a lot of that, those uh, uh, recommendations were not followed. I think that's where we did worst in, in, in Sweden. Um, I think still, and I, again, not a medical expert, but I don't think it would have hurt to advocate it if we had advocated a little bit more for mask use. I, I, I can't see the harm in that, really. Um, and we did poorly compared to the Nordic countries. We did actually fairly well when it comes to, to, um, to the re to rest of Europe but worse than Denmark, Norway, Finland. And we got a lot of flack for that. Some things were good. The recommendations, I've talked about those. Those, are, those were followed to a large extent. Uh, it was a good thing to keep the, the primary schools open for learning rates. We have seen statistics now, and I don't have them here, specifically from Norway, which had much, they had much more tighter lockdowns when it came to primary schools. And they now have a huge backlog of young people. Of course, they're not, no longer in, in second grade or third grade. They are now in sixth and seventh grade, and they are behind. They, they, they didn't learn a lot because they were kept at home for a, almost a year. And we did better than, than the EU average. And I think actually I didn't put that in slide in here. But if you compare the, the total um, excess deaths uh, cumulative in Europe, Sweden is among the top seven on the good side. So there's a lot of countries that did much, much worse. But we did badly the first year. So, uh, I, this is not just me speculating. I have some support here. Uh, this is Emma Fanz, who is uh, a science journalist in Sweden, very, very knowledgeable, has a medical degree as well. So, uh, she wrote this article for the, in the conversation. And I bring, I, she wrote other things as well, but this, since this is in English, this is something you could look up. Did Sweden's controversial COVID <laughs> strategy pay off? In may, many ways it did, but we let the elderly down. And I. I, that is also how I feel about this. Uh, that's what, what happened. So uh, the Swedish experiment is, that's not a fair way to characterize this because it wasn't an experiment. Remember, there was a plan. Anders Tegnell had a, had a plan. He was extremely stubborn to stick with the plan. 
And I can't fault him for that. that. That's a good idea. Don't panic and try to invent new things based on speculation. So there was a plan. So was it a good plan? I don't know. That, would, it, would there have been a better plan? Probably. But it was better than no plan at all. Uh, and we main, you can't go back in history and re rerun the experiment, right? So we don't know. Uh, but there was a plan. Um, and the reporting of it was very, very misleading because it wasn't the Russian roulette. It wasn't an, ex an experiment. It was different. It, I think it was very much up to one guy, Anders Tegnell, again. He, he had a huge influence on that. But I don't think um, that's not how it was portrayed uh, in, uh, abroad or even uh, locally. So, so I, I mentioned that politician could take a step back and point to the health authorities. They, they fix it because they are the experts. Um, we saw in other countries where politicians were actually competing in, in inventing the most radical or uh, most creative solutions to this problem and also sometimes counterproductive. They, they, they in, implemented certain things and then they took them away again, and it was very confusing for everybody. I would say politicians make very bad scientists, because even if you could teach a politician science, and I'm sure there are politicians who understand science, the politicians that get elected are not the most scientific ones. It's the, the ones who uh, speak to the, to, the, to the voters. So it becomes, by definition, sort of populistic. So I wouldn't really want to leave science in the hands of, of uh, politicians. Also, I would not, and this is something I didn't realize until, th this is something I learned during this pandemic, scientists are really poor policymakers. Because scientists, even Anders Tegnell, was saying, so, well, we can't take that decision yet because we need more data. And I think they were very, very, it, I wouldn't call it slow, but they, they didn't react fast anyway, because they always, they always, and we don't know exactly yet. There was a debate for many months how much the virus was spreading on surface areas, on in the air, how airborne is it really? And so as, as long as we don't, this was actually what Anders Tegnell said first, as long as we don't know if it's how airborne it is, I'm not going to recommend uh, face masks because we don't know. I would say, well, that to be careful, maybe you do it anyway. You use mask anyway while you're figuring this out. Well, that would be my call, of course. So I don't know what the solution is in a pandemic like this. And I'm afraid and I'm sure that we will face this again sometime, for hopefully not tomorrow, but it will happen again, something, something similar. I don't know who I would want to, to take the decisions because politicians are very much opportunistic in doing what they think will buy them votes. And scientists are not comfortable with going forward and saying, let's do this. No, we want to have more data. They always want more data because that's the safe place that they go to when they get stressed. I don't want to take decisions now, I don't. so I don't know. And um, I guess uh, that's the end of the, the slides, but I'm open for questions, of course. So thank you very much for this introduction to this very complex topic that has been interpreted and misinterpreted many times over. Um, pokud máte nějaké otázky, necítíte se na to je klást v angličtině, my vám je rádi přeložíme do angličtiny, takže klidně se ptejte česky. Uh, while people are figuring out their questions, I already I have some, a couple for you. Oh, yeah, good. <laughs> Jinak uh, uděláme to, jako jsme to dělali teď minule, pokud máte nějakou otázku, pojď, prosím, přijďte sem dopředu, aby jsme vám ji mohli nahrát na tento speciální streamovací mikrofon. Uh, so, a new plan. Is there a new plan in de a development in Sweden? I don't know. It's the, I, I don't know if they have changed the plan. I'm sure they have done something, but I'm not, I'm, I have no insight into that. Um, hopefully we learned something. 
And uh, the Swedish health agency has a reputation for being very scientific, and I'm sure they have a lot new data uh, now to, to analyze and try to, to, um, to, to digest. But I haven't seen the new plan. I don't know. Okay. Uh, what is the current feeling in Sweden? Uh, do people feel that everything is over now? Uh, or how are, they fe how are they feeling in regards to the pandemic? Yes, I think people are feeling in general, people are acting as it's all over and talked about it like that already last summer, uh, this early autumn. So I think some, some Swedes were very surprised when the WHO went out last week and said, now the pandemic is over. So, what? The pandemic has been over for a long time. For practical reasons, I think, uh, for, or in, in practice, I should say. Uh, and and I, don't see, I don't see too many uh, uh, reports about deaths and, and uh, what, what, we talk, what we talk a little bit about, of course, and also in the rest of the world is the phenomena of long COVID, post COVID symptoms. And those are, are different and uh, has to be addressed differently. But yes, the short answer, I think Swedes are now feeling that the pandemic is over. Do we have any questions from the audience? Nina Michael Tasco? Prasim? Hello. Uh, uh, do you know uh, how many people uh, infected in hosp Sweden hospitals? Uh, it, it was a problem with uh, with it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I, I know that I don't have an exact figure on that, but I know it was a problem. I know we, uh, we everybody, and that's not just a Swedish problem. You struggled with it. You tried to make separate separate emergency in entrances for COVID and for others. You don't want to mix the, the other patients with the COVID patients. So that happened to an extent. I don't know if it, that was worse in Sweden than in other, any other place. I, I couldn't say. Magnus Dautschut asked what was? Uh, hello, good, uh, good evening. I would like to ask you for one thing that uh, in your statistic there is no data about the Russian and other countries uh, do, because there is an interesting data because they do almost nothing. You know, that's, yeah, I, okay. There was one thing that I forgot to mention. I can get into that. I, the, the short answer is I don't trust the data from Russia. So I don't know if I have data that we can rely on. I mean, there, there is data. But I don't know how good quality it is. But I want to say one thing, and that is one reason maybe that the number of COVID deaths. May, let me go back to that slide when I showed Spain. And they compared uh, the number of COVID deaths with the excess deaths there. There's a big discrepancy here. You have 28,000 di di died of COVID, but 43,000 above normal. So what did the other? Uh, in Sweden, we had much better match there. We had almost exactly the same number of COVID deaths reported as excess deaths reported. And that is, I think, Sweden is very proud over its statistics. We are good at statistics. I think we have the oldest statistical uh, institution in the world. It's from the 1700s or, or, or 1700s, and we have data about the population all the way since then. And again, when Swedes, in Swedes, as I said before, do not, uh, they do trust the authorities. It's pretty reliable data as well. It's, it's not fabricated. It hasn't been changed a lot. So I think we're very good at classifying deaths as COVID deaths when they were COVID deaths within other countries and I would say Russia or other countries where there's a war, China who wants to have a, you know, they have reasons to hide certain things. I don't know if we can trust that statistic. So I haven't actually looked at those statistics. Africa, I think that's, I think it's wrong to think of Africa as one area. I think it's very different in different parts of Africa. I think there are parts of Africa where it's very hard to get data because they don't have the infrastructure, they don't have... I think there are other countries in Africa where, where they're much better at it, so... We shouldn't call it... It's not one country. <laughs> I have a question from chat. It's uh, from Pavel Schmeikal, and he hey, asks... Pavel. 
I know him. <laughs> he asks uh, people in the Czech Republic who refused uh, government regulation, which is uh, wearing masks, lockdowns, etc., often pointed uh, uh, to Sweden. How did the Swedes themselves perceive the policy of uh, handling the pandemic? I think it was very polarized. I think there was a the vast majority, I think, were very happy with it. I, I, as I said before, that under Stegnell, he got death threats, but he also was uh, made a hero by some people. And I think most people trusted him. Most people thought it was good, hand, it was well handled. But there were some, uh, there was a man minority, not too small minority, and they were very loud in their criticism. There was a, um, there was a, uh, self-proclaimed uh, committee of 30 scientists that were very, very adamant that uh, Anders Tegnell should be removed from office immediately. He didn't know what he was doing, didn't know what he was uh, talking about. And, uh, but I, I, so that got a lot of, that got a lot of uh, um, attention in the media, but I don't know that Swedes really felt like that. It was a small minority. I think I think most people were pretty. They, they were. They were. We. Uh, you know. We have. Um, you. You have your. Uh, what, what the Sisyphus Prize? What do you call that? The erratic boulder. The negative. Yeah. Price, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. The erratic boulder. We have a similar one in Sweden. It's called something else. I don't. And, but we also have a, a, a prize for somebody who's done something very good. And Anders Tegnell was nominated in both categories a lot during the 2020 specifically. So it was different. <laughs> hmm? Any other question from the audience? If not, uh, during the next pandemic, uh, do you think that the Swedes would accept uh, stricter recommendations uh, from the start? I'm, it's hard enough when I speculate about the past. Now I'm speculating <laughs> about the future. As a good skeptic, you have yes. to pull out your crystal ball. Yeah, so uh, always the skeptic. So I have to point out when I'm speculating. Uh, I, th I think it would be more or less the same. I think it would be more or less the same. That's my gut feeling. Huh. Okay. Huh. So the neighbors would kind of make sure that the other neighbors were doing what they were supposed to be yes, doing. We would continue to police each other. And uh, we would, everybody would be, be more prepared, I guess. It wouldn't even, it probably, in that case, it would be better because if we have this in, in, pure, in uh, fresh memory, we know how bad it can be. So people would be probably quicker to catch on and say, oh, another one, we don't want that. So let's, let's try to, to behave. Hmm? I'll have a question of my own. Uh, Regarding the cultural differences, uh, I think that uh, in general it's uh, uh, good when the European Union or the states that are like together are preparing their plans uh, uh, to together generally. Mm -hmm. But do you think it's even possible for things like pandemics due to the cultural differences? We, ha we have seen that, for example, Swedes uh, are more likely to follow the guidelines while in here uh, people don't even follow the law. So <laughs> how, how to approach these things uh, to, to get to it, uh, yeah. to the whole Europe? I understand your question. No, I think you're onto something there. I, uh, if we say that Africa is more than one country, I think still Europe is many different countries. And I, d I think even Anders Tegnell said that my strategy would not have worked in other, in other countries. And I don't know if he's right in that, but I, no, I think to some extent you have to, you have to take cultural differences into, to, or factors into account when you do policies like this. You have to, it, it, it is different from country to country and you have to take that into account, I think so. You can't, it, it's hard enough for, for Europe to agree, we know that. Uh, in all other kinds of questions. We're trying with the EU, but uh, it's not always easy. And um, yeah, I think, I think you have to some, to some extent tailor it. But it would have been good, of course, if we could all agree on one thing, and that was it, it basta. Everybody was doing the best, hopefully the best plan possible, but I think not. Uh, following, following up on that, um, I'm interested in uh, uh, the other Scandinavian countries. Were they more restrictive than Sweden? Yes. Or um, uh, what was? Can you elaborate a bit more about the um, like um, the Danish and Swedish dialogue about the restrictions? Because um, 
it, uh, it's hard to imagine the same policies would work in Czechia. Mm -hmm. But is it hard to imagine that the same policies would uh, work or not work, for example, in Norway? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I think there's cultural differences also there. For one thing, uh, Norway did actually suffer through a Swedish occupation and a Danish occupation. So when I'm saying Sweden, it's not that long ago, even though it was resolved in the end uh, amicably. No, it was different. They did have different responses and there was a lot of finger pointing between the health authorities in the four countries, Norway, Sweden, Denmark and Finland. They, were, they did not agree. And Anders Tegnell was on one side and the other three was on the other side. And um, so, uh, no, it, w it wasn't the same, and I don't, maybe it sh couldn't be the same. But even, even between Norway and, and Denmark, it wasn't the same. We can see that the statistics I had about testing. Denmark put all the resources into testing, and it seems to have worked. So that may be a good idea. While uh, Norway did more of a, I would say, traditional, but a lockdown in the same way that other countries in Europe did, and they, they closed the schools, and so, while in Sweden we didn't close the schools. We did, I should say, this was, when I say we didn't close the schools in Sweden, we didn't close the, 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 the younger, the schools for the younger students. For um, uh, the older ones, like people, well, if you're ninth grader or, or so, eighth grader, ninth grader and above, it, we switched to uh, uh, virtual classrooms. So we did actually close them, but continued. But you can't do that with uh, uh, an eight-year-old, I don't think. Any hmm. other questions? Yes? Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is uh, about the culture differences. Mm -hmm. I was very surprised that uh, uh, the, one of the most re restrictive countries was uh, United Kingdom. Yeah. It was a great surprise for me because I think that uh, the culture of uh, United Kingdom is about uh, the freedom of speech, about the freedom of assembly, and uh, that uh, British people also trust authorities uh, and uh, trust the government, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that it's uh, a bit uh, similar culture to, to Nordic countries, I think. Yeah, uh, I think uh, to a certain extent, but we should remember that they have had a very traumatic experience lately or recently with Brexit. <laughs> and even before that, there's been a lot of distrust in, in uh, certain politicians. So, and also, when it came out, uh, Boris Johnson uh, forced everybody to go home from the pub, talk about cultural differences. How can you close the pub in the UK? That's <laughs> outrageous. And then at the same time, the prime minister is having parties at 10 Downing Street. So I think uh, a lot of that trust has been spent in the UK over the last years. Yes, but maybe it was not a good idea to, to close pubs. No, maybe not, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and the same uh, for me, the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Also, it is, it is a country of uh, great culture, tradition of, uh, of freedom and, and yeah. f free movement and free assembly for centuries. But it, yeah, okay. I see what you mean, but it is in a different way. For, in Sweden, we, we were, we're we felt free, but also trusting. In both the UK and in, and in the Netherlands as well, that, it's a lot of uh, revolutionary movements there. And they are free to express them, yes, but it doesn't mean that they agree with the authorities. Right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, the second, uh, and my second question is uh, about uh, the uh, vaccination in Sweden. Yeah. How, how, uh, how did it look? Uh, what, uh, wo was it obligatory or, or not? Uh, or what, was, uh, what was the um, um, attitude. Yeah. attitude of on vaccination? No, uh, uh, we should uh, realize by now the answer was recommendations. <laughs> so, but they were followed. People did actually get vaccinated. It was almost a... A, uh, you had um, 
almost a race to, as soon as they, they opened, the, there was a shortage of, of vac vaccines. People really wanted to get vaccinated, except, of course, for a little small uh, minority, which was very loud and also got our erratic bold, uh, erratic bolder uh, prize in 2020. Yeah. Uh, and what, what was the percentage of uh, uh, vaccinated people? Do you know Ooh, it? More statistics. I have forgotten to uh, remember that, <laughs> if that's a way to phrase it. I don't know, but it, it, it was high and it is high. Uh, it's tapering off now, I think, but since the Swedes are feeling that the pandemic has been over for a long time, even though that's not true, I think uh, it's, it's going back. There was actually a change of the recommendations already for, from 1st of January this year, and then from 1st of March, they did it in two cases so that Actually, and that was criticized, p young uh, children do not no longer have a right to get a vaccine for free. So uh, from, that's a new rule. They said, we, we're not even going to bother with that because they don't get very sick anyway. And the new strains of the virus isn't bad enough, but for people my age and above and also a little bit below, is there still recommendations to, to get vaccinated. Any other questions? If we're done with all the serious questions, I'll ask a less serious one. Oh. So at the beginning of the pandemic, um, there was a horrible factory fire in Sweden where uh, the toilet pa paper factory yeah. burned down. So how are the Swedes with their toilet paper? Do you have some now or what's the situation? <laughs> <laughs> I have my private stash, <laughs> just in case. It was, that, that was made up. That was more of a fun story, to be honest. But, but the, 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 it is true that just like in many other countries, the, there was a shortage of toilet paper for a little while. Not long, but for a month or so, it was a little bit hard to get toilet paper because everybody was buying them. And then came the big news that in Lilla Edet in Sweden, that's the, place of the name of the place, uh, where the, one of the biggest factories of, of toilet <laughs> rolls, it was on fire, and, uh, but somehow they managed to continue to produce. Uh, we, I, we don't have a shortage of, <laughs> of toilet paper, no. But I'll make sure to steal one roll at the hotel before I go back, just in case. Yes, just in case. So thank you so much, Pontus, for coming and giving us uh, this talk. Um, for those of you who are watching from home, uh, next month we do have another person from Sweden coming, but it's going to be a Canadian person coming coming from Sweden, Philip Longchamp, who will talk about uh, education and, and uh, a new way how to look at education, uh, integrating critical thinking across various uh, specialties and classes. And uh, we saw him speak at the European Skeptics Highly Congress in Vienna. Yes. You know him personally. Yeah. Uh, he's also a member of the Swedish Skeptics. So he's a wonderful speaker. So please do come and uh, listen to his lecture. Thank you again, Pontus. Thank you for having me. Uh, it, this is your second time in Prague. It is? Yes. So uh, you already know Chick Beer, but I will still invite you to try it I again can, I'm just to make sure. I'm to learn more. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. And uh, yeah, uh, see, uh, yeah, see you soon. It's amazing. Thank you.